All right. Uh, we're looking at John 17 today. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've had a cold, but I think it's almost gone. So thank you for bearing with me. John 17, we're going to start with verse 1. John 17 and verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son may also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life as to many as those as hast given him, as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of, thou, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And we'll stop there, and the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word. The time for his teaching of his disciples here in this upper room is over. He has finished the lesson, so to speak. And now we're going to enter into what I consider to be like Moses and the burning bush. We're almost entering into holy ground here. This is one of those times in scripture where it seems like the Lord has drawn the curtain back for us to enter into the very presence of God. And we get to hear a conversation between the Father and the Son. Psalms 110 is this type where he says, The Lord said unto my Lord, that sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We have a God who wants to be known by us. And as we look at this passage, that will be very clear. We have a God who lets us listen in on conversations between the Godhead. I don't know if you ever stopped and thought about that, but that's pretty spectacular when you think about it, that God allows us to listen in on his conversation. And that's what we have here. We're eavesdropping on a conversation between the Father and the Son. We hear the Lord's innermost thoughts in an intimate conversation with the Father. And I believe that, that nowhere else in scripture we see the mind of Christ. And I think we do well to let this soak in. The depth of the mind of Christ is beyond our ability to fathom, but it's always worth the effort and the joy that we get from the attempt to understand the mind of Christ as much as we can. This is intercessory prayer. In this chapter, Christ is our great high priest. It's like he's taken the golden censer before the Father. It is a preface to his sacrifice on the cross. It is a sample of the intercession which he now carries on for us at the right hand of the majesty of high. And so we have here the present intercessory work that he's doing for us. As we saw last time we were together, that we have direct access to the Father. And yet, we have the Lord Jesus as our high priest praying to the Father for us on a continual daily basis. I don't know if you've thought about that. But that should be a real encouragement to us. There are times that we feel so alone in this in this virus, quarantine, shutdown, isolation has caused some people to feel very alone. And yet we have a God who has not left us alone. And we have a savior who is praying for us to the father on a constant basis. Let's look at verse one. 
we are given John, only given John's account of this prayer. We find this prayer nowhere else in, in, in the Gospels. And you can see it's an intimate account of a loving observer. And the first thing he tells us is that the Lord lifted up his eyes and looked into heaven. So John's close enough to hear this prayer. He's close enough to see the Lord's actions. He's listening intently to this prayer. And as he lifts up his eyes, he addresses his father. It's interesting in this chapter, he's going to address the father and he's going to use three different names. Here is the father. Later, it will be the Holy Father. And then when we come to verse 25, he's going to address him as a righteous father. Now, I'm not saying that this prayer is exactly an example for us, but I know sometimes I get in the rut of just saying, Father, Father, Father. But I, you'll notice that during this prayer of the Lord, that, that, that he changes how he addresses the Father. And glory is a key word of this prayer. It, 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 we, we find it occurring, a form of that, of glory appearing five times. And then in the book of John, we come and it says the hour is come. We see this, we see the hour mentioned 10 times in the book of, of John. Five times the hour has not come. And then five times we're told the hour has come. It is a central point of time and the climax between the two eternities. This hour, this time, this point in time is the pinnacle of grace and the gospel. And his hour has now come. And then the only personal request we find in this whole prayer, the rest of the prayer is, is intercessory, but we do have this one personal re request and it's glorify thy son Glorify thy son. Later, the Lord will not will, will say, not my will, but thine be done. But here we have a unity of wills. Both the Father and the Son desire that the Son be glorified. And that the Father be glorified to the, to the Son. It's not an added glory, but is a revealing or a manifestation of who the Son is. The time has come for the world to see that Jesus, who he is. For the Jews, the Messiah, for everyone else, the Savior of the world, the one through his suffering and sacrifice on the cross would bring victory over this curse of sin and death. We spend a lot of time meditating and thinking about that victory over sin and death and what it means to us. But this is where the world for the first time will see what happens. And, and so Christ's desire for glory has an even greater purpose that his glory might result in the glory of the Father. We talked a little bit about praying in Jesus' name last time we were together. And that's the idea, is that we pray in a way that would glorify the Son and ultimately glorify the Father. When you pray for an unsaved person, you can, you can pray that there would become trophies of grace so that God might be glorified in their lives. And we're appealing to God to save them so that it might result in his glory. And we spent quite a bit of time discussing that last time, so we won't bring that um, back. But we find Jesus asking for glory on two counts. First, he is, he is God in the flesh, who is now reclaiming that which was rightfully his. And secondly, this glorification of himself is necessary in order for the Father to be glorified. Verse 2. Jesus was given authority to grant eternal life. This, this word power is, is a word for authority. He was given the authority to grant eternal life. Adam was given authority over creation, but he sinned was, and was driven from the garden. Jesus is a new Adam. He's not made in the image of God as Adam. Adam was made in likeness of the image of God. Jesus Christ is 
the very image of God, as we as uh, Matt read this morning from Hebrews, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Adam was made in the likeness of God. Jesus Christ is God. He's the very express image of God. He is who God is. And so Jesus made uh, um, has a weight of authority overcome the fall and give humans eternal life. When Adam sinned in the garden, he was driven from the garden and the cherubims were set up to guard the tree of knowledge, uh, the tree of life. Jesus comes and he has the right to offer us the tree of life because of his power and authority over the angels as Hebrews so clearly tells us he has. He's a creator of the angels. He's, a, he's the authority over the angels. He's higher than the angels. And yet he became lower than the angels so that he might obtain salvation for us. Verse three, and this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Too often we think of eternal life as a fire insurance against hell. To be sure we are saved, as we've talked about this morning, the wrath of hell when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But eternal life is so much more than that. We really limit our thinking if that's all we think that it is. Many appreciate the fact that, that our salvation is eternal, and I'm thankful that it's eternal. I'm, as Ray prayed, I'm thankful that I'm not responsible to, to keep my salvation. I, I feel so sorry for those who are confused about their eternal security. And they think they have to work and strive to keep their salvation. I'm thankful that my salvation is eternal. Others appreciate the fact that eternal life speaks to the quality of life rather than the duration of life. Because eternal life is a quality, not just a duration. What the Father is calling to our attention here, though, I believe, in this eternal life, at its core, is our relationship with Jesus Christ and the Father. We have a God who wants to be known. We have a God who wants a fellowship with us. One of the things I enjoy about the breaking of bread is when we can enter into God's own thoughts about his dear son, that we can fellowship with God about what he thinks about his son, that we can see him as God's beloved son in whom he was well pleased. John, I think, grasps this, and he's in John 1 and 3, he says, And truly our fellowship with, us, with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The aspect of eternal life that John is telling us the Lord's praying for is our relational fellowship we have with the Father and the Son. I don't know if you've stopped and thought about that. I don't know if you've considered the depth of that. But I think it's really important. I, Paul, I think, grasps this. Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. We can know the Son and we can know the Father. They aren't just things to worship. They're knowable. They want a relationship with you. I think sometimes when we pray, we forget that we're speaking to someone who wants us to know him and wants to reveal himself to us through his son. Ultimately, as Paul would point out, is that as we know him and we get to know him and truly know him in an intimate way, we reflect his character to those around us. They become they see us, they see Christ in us. Verse four, and I've glorified thee on earth. 
and I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Proclaiming God's character so that people might see him as he is, that is the work that Jesus came to do. Psalms 40 and 7 tells us about this. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I preach righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and the truth from the great congregation. It is at the cross that Jesus Christ declares who the Father is. We understand God's love and God's grace that God can be both just and the justifier of Jesus Christ, and he can be both just and righteous at the same, righteous and yet pour out his grace upon us because of the work of the cross. As Psalms tells us, righteousness and peace kiss. I struggle with being a gracious and at the same time be someone who holds the, the just demands of the law. I'm so glad God did not. That God was based both being able to be righteous and holy and just and at the same time pour his grace out on me through the work of his son. Everything about Jesus, what he taught, the miracles he performed, the conversations in which he engaged, all were designed to show the true nature of God. In John 14, we read it earlier. Believest thou not that I am the Father and the Father in me? The words that I spake unto you speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He does he doeth the works, believe me, for I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sakes. So the Lord Jesus could say both by word and by work, he declared, he made manifest who the Father was to us. The disciples, John wrote in John 1, 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten son who, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. We know who God is because of the work and the words of Jesus Christ. The first work he did was to enter into this world. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Just entering into this world showed the glory of the Father. God w with us, Emmanuel, as the angels did proclaim at his, glory, at, at his birth, glory to God in the highest. The, the fact that, as the psalmist said, who is man that thou art mindful of him, that God would intervene in the course of time for our salvation by becoming man so that he might die for us is glory unto God in and of itself because it reveals the grace of God. So Jesus revealed to us that we have a God who is full of grace. So, so many people think God's this harsh God or God's this force of wrath but it's just not true we have a god who would humble himself to become human i i've been so taken up the last couple of years with the fact that we have a humble god how much does that tell us that we need to be humble as we reflect his character to this world A God that would substitute himself in our place for punishment. A God who is just and able to justify us by his grace, by the work on the cross. And then, he, and then the Lord Jesus said, I have accomplished the work. He could say it is finished. He, we, we, we call this looking into the future anticipatory past tense that God sees it as done because we have a God who's able to predict the future and guarantee that it will come true. 
He's not confined by time. And he often speaks of actions as being accomplished, which are yet in the future. And the Lord Jesus was seeing the future as good as done or accomplished as he looks forward to the cross. Only God can both know the future and guarantee that it will happen and declare it will happen. Great, great passages in Isaiah 40 and 41, where he says, show me your cause. Who can make it? Who can say it will happen and then make it so? One of the things that prophecy is such a proof of who God is is because only God can tell you the future before it happens and then know and make sure that it happens. I can, I can plan the future. I can plan for tomorrow, but I can't tell you whether it's going to happen or not. But we have a God who's able to do that. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before the world. If we were speaking in, ter in human terms, we'd say that the work of glorifying the, the, of the Father is a team effort between the Son and the Father. And this, it would probably be better translated here Glorify me with thine own self. It, it, it's better translated. Darby does a good, cho a, a good job. And it'd be better translated at, their, at thine own side. Is the idea of him sitting next to God, of, of, of sitting in majesty, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. That he has returned to the throne. I don't know if you've carefully studied Hebrews, but when you study Hebrews, it makes such a point that he sat down. And it's so important to understand that the only person who would sit in the presence of God is God himself. And so that's, that's what he's saying here. He's not asking for a new glory. No, he was asking to return to the glory that he had before incarnation. I don't and can't explain how he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. But we know that he was not manifested in the glory that he now is manifested in heaven while he was on earth. And that's what he's talking about. Paul explains this in Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And Paul tells us that's exactly what happened. He was given that glory that he had before he came to earth. It was not a new glory. It was a glory he had before. A glory, if you would, that he laid aside. And so he's finished the work. He's ready to return to his previous state of glory but with a difference that now the world would come better comprehend the knowledge of God through his death and resurrection. We understand who God is because of his death and resurrection. We would not fully understand the grace of God without Jesus' death and resurrection, as we, as we so eloquently well said this morning by several of you, and I appreciate that very much. There's coming a day when Jesus will be seen in all his glory. He will come first for his saints, but then we're told that he is going to come in his, in his glory with his saints and every eye will behold him. Now, Peter wrote that he had a taste of this on the mountain. In, in 2 Peter 1 and, 8, and 16, he says this, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, and we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, where were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from the God the Father honor and glory, where there came such a voice from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
it is that majesty that was displayed on the mount, that glory, if you would, that was displayed on the mount to those three disciples. That's the glory that the Lord is speaking of when he asked to be returned to that. That majesty that he had before, he's going to have again. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and they gavest me, and they kept thy word. The name of God was revealed to Moses in the burning bush. In, in, in Exodus 3.13, it says this, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? <clears throat> and then as we track through the scriptures, especially in Genesis 31 where, and 32, where Moses asked for God to show him his name and show him his way and show him his glory, it's clear that the name of Jehovah, the name means so much. In, in Exodus 3, it, then it goes on to saying, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thou shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. That is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. And so we, we say Yahweh or Jehovah as a self-existing one, but the one who is going to come and intervene in the course of time, that they had a personal God who was going to come and rescue them from the slavery of Egypt. Isaiah 42 and 8, it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 43 and 11 says this, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved. I have showed where there is no stranger, strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day that I am he, there is none that can deliver out of the hand. I will work, and it, sh and it shall be. This is a name that Jesus revealed while he was on earth. This is a name Jesus applied to himself, and the religious leaders threatened to stone him for his blasphemy. He reveals the name of God to the people. I have manifested thy name. I've showed them who Jehovah is. We see this um, in John 8. Jesus actually uses the name God in reference to him, or Jehovah in reference to himself, where three times he verbalized a unique, start, startling phrase, I am. Without a predicate, I am stands alone. Later, he will include a predicate, and, and we know those seven I am sayings, I'm the door, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, and so forth. But here he does it, he stands alone. The most well-known of these are John 8 and 58, and Jesus said, and verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He left no doubt what he was saying. This is not standard Greek grammar. It was clear to the Jewish ear that he was claiming to be Jehovah. This, this would have been so shocking to them, and we know it was because then they accused him of blasphemy. They accused him of claiming to be God. Here he comes, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, tells them who he is, and they totally missed it. And they totally rejected it. In Matthew 12, we're told three times, he says that a greater than the temple is here, a greater than Solomon is here, and a greater than Jonah was here. Here stood before him their king, their prophet, and greater than the priest, a new high priest after the, after the order of Melchizedek, and they missed it. And he tells them that the queen of Sheba, the people of Nineveh, will rise up in judgment on them 
because a great, the greatest one of all, Jehovah himself, was in their midst, and they missed it. And they missed it. Words that were first spoken to Moses at the burning bush were spoken to Jesus by the Israelites, to the Jews. I know people who say that they, Jesus never claimed to be God. You would have to be ignorant and remain in your ignorance to miss his claim to be equal and to be God. To be equal with God and to be God himself. However, the greatest manifestation of Jehovah the fact that Jehovah cared for his people, that Jehovah entered time and space to save his people, was about ready to take place when Jesus would become the perfect, satisfactory, propitiation sacrifice, substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of the world. And Matthew makes this clear that that is when Jesus was going to show the Father to everyone. Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things are delivered unto me and my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the, the, the Son will reveal him. The Son revealed the Father at the cross and at the resurrection and at his ascension. Jesus completed the work of manifesting the name of the Father to us. And then it says, Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and thou hast kept my, and they have kept my word. Some would read doctrine into this, a doctrine of, of predetermination. But I think in the context, that's not what he's talking about. Jesus is speaking to the Father, and the idea here is that these men were already followers of Jehovah. They were true and genuine believers in God. They were gods to start with. Many who claimed to be followers of God failed to recognize the Son. These disciples were truly believers in Jehovah, and they recognized the Son for who he was. And they came to believe as a result of him giving them the very words that the Father had given them. And then he's able to say, and they have kept thy word. They have been true. They have un honestly understood and seen. As Peter said, who should we go to for, for eternal life? You are the son of God. They recognized him for who they were. It wasn't that God chose them and gave them to Jesus. Is that <clears throat> they believed and Jesus received them from the Father who at first had their belief. As we think about this passage, what I'm so impressed is that, is that we have a God who wants to be known. What a gracious, loving God we have who wants to have an intimate relationship with us. It is incredible to me that a sinner such as I can have a relationship with God, the creator of this universe. It's simply amazing. And it's no wonder we call it amazing grace. If you don't know the Father through the Son, his offer is, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and thank you for this time. We thank you for this passage. We thank you that we can know the eternal God through his son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you intervened in time and space to bring about salvation to the finished work of your son there at Calvary. And then, Father, we thank you that we can have eternal life through the knowledge and knowing 
the Son, and the Father. Oh, Father, we would enter into that fellowship that we can have with each other, but even greater the fellowship we have with the Father and the Son. And Father, we would pray like Paul, that we might know him. And in the knowing of Jesus Christ, that we know the Father. May our understanding, our depth of knowledge, our, our intimacy with the Father and the Son grow and grow through the grace that has been demonstrated through Jesus Christ our Lord. We give you thanks in the name of the Father and in the Father's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.